Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, also known as MW2, is considered one of the best Call of Duty games in the entire series. With the epic campaign mode and equally epic spec ops mode, I cannot blame them for thinking that. Let's take a look and see why this game is the greatest Modern Warfare ever made in my opinion. And if you enjoy the video, be sure to 360 no scope the like button and leave a comment if you want to see more content like this, old or modern. So let's start off with one of the best Call of Duty campaigns I've ever played. You have the main story where you play as main protagonist Sergeant Gary Roach Sanderson under the Task Force 141 unit, while during the secondary story you first play as Private First Class Joseph Allen under the US Army Rangers, then as Private James Ramirez under the same unit. I'll go over the main story first, then the secondary story in order. For the main story, you have your prologue mission. You play as Roach where you're sent to a Russian airbase with Captain John Soap McTavish, located in the mountains of Kakistan with silenced weapons, one of them including a heartbeat sensor, to recover an ACS module before the Russians can get sensitive information out of it. There's one point where you guys get found out after finding the module, but thanks to C4s you were able to place around the base prior, you were able to set it off to create a diversion so you and Soap can escape. Here's where things get even crazier. While you guys go down a snowy cliff and take down enemy soldiers shooting at you while riding snowmobiles, you take them down and hijack their snowmobiles to escape. So if you're a racing fanatic, you could get your racing on with the snowmobiles while dodging enemy soldiers and snowmobiles plus helicopters firing at you. You have to make it to the extraction point through all of this. To start the main story, you are sent by presumed supporting character General Shepard as an undercover CIA agent while playing as Private Allen under the alias Alexei Borodin. This was after being transferred from the Army Rangers to Task Force 141. You're put alongside the presumed main antagonist of the game Vladimir Makarov. Makarov is a terrorist who seeks revenge after his mentor Imran Zakayev was unalived back in COD 4. While you're undercover, Makarov and his team conduct a false flag attack by unaliving innocent civilians at a Russian airport to make it seem like it was an attack carried out by Americans even though everyone but Allen was Russian. That's why Makarov says this at the very start of the level. Remember, no Russian. Before Riot Shield FSB soldiers arrive outside of the airport to go after the terrorists, Makarov says this. This solidifies what I said earlier about Makarov seeking revenge. Towards the end of the level, before you can make a getaway, Makarov unalives you and leaves you there, which results in Private Allen's demise and Russia's outcry to go to war with the United States of America. Here's a few plot holes I've noticed though. So Makarov at the very end of the level says when the Russians find the body that all of Russia will cry for war, but Allen was American. Plus, when Task Force 141 goes after Makarov's weapons dealer, the place of origin for the bullets was in Brazil. So why would the Russians want a cry for war or presuming Allen was Russian when he was American all along, especially when Makarov's plan was to make it seem like Americans were the ones who orchestrated the massacre at the airport with American weapons. I find that kind of strange. And one final side note, I don't know if I'm blind or the reverse compatible digital copy of MW2 for the Xbox 360 didn't have it, but I heard there was a disclaimer that lets you skip the mission because of its graphic content, even though from the time I played the campaign I have never seen this warning before. That's extremely weird as well but it is what it is. But anyway, as mentioned earlier, you're sent by General Shepard to go to Rio de Janeiro where you go after Makarov's weapons dealer Alejandro Rojas. So you team up with your allies Soap and Ghost. You gotta fight through the favela to locate Rojas while taking down the Brazilian militia. You also gotta be very careful to avoid harming civilians while pushing through the favela. At the end of the level from the top floor of a building, Soap channels his inner Roman reins and hits a crazy ass inverted spear through the glass where they land right on top of the car. I'm shocked Rojas was able to survive the landing, but I'm even more shocked that there wasn't a crowd somewhere chanting like crazy. Holy shit! Unfortunately for them, they couldn't get a hold of command to send the chopper their way to get them out of Brazil. But what they got out of Rojas was a man that Makarov hated more than Americans, which is a prisoner locked up in a Russian gulag. Soap is able to get a hold of a returning support character, Nikolai, to get them out of there. So you guys gotta fight your way out of Brazil. One of the craziest and coolest sequences though is when Soap fails to catch you when you fall off of a building. After falling, you wake up to this massive army approaching from the sides looking for you. You gotta run for your life and make it to the rooftops while having the army 
spraying bullets at you like a hose, with soap screaming at you with directions to go and make sure you make it to them. This was pretty intense because of the severity, especially with Nikolai saying he must leave in half a minute because of low fuel. After leaving Brazil, General Shepard informs Task Force 141 that the prisoner that was presumed to be the man Makarov hates is Prisoner 627, but an oil rig being used as a SAM site is preventing them from getting to the Gulag. So Shepard sends the task force along with the 6th Fleet of the Navy SEALs to rescue hostages trapped in the oil rig while taking down enemy forces. You get this super cool sequence of riding in the submarine where you get to look around in the ocean and even get some fishes swimming around on some Finding Nemo shit. After quietly taking out two guards you make it to the rig where you guys breach a room full of hostages to rescue them. After breaching the second room, Ghost hears enemy commotion through the radio presuming they've been found out. So Soap orders you to plant C4s on the dead bodies of the enemies as part of plan B. After you hit the explosion, you guys have to fight your way to the top deck to breach the final room to save the rest of the hostages, including fighting off a chopper and being forced to use thermal weapons at the top deck to take down enemies because of the smoke. Once you do that and breach the final room, you leave in the chopper while the marines secure the rig and take care of the rest. And now you're off to the gulag. After fighting your way into the gulag and making it into an old tunnel system, you break the wall and meet prisoner 627, who is none other than the legendary Captain John Price, who returns to the series. Here's another plot hole. Towards the very end of Call of Duty 4 after Zakaev is killed, loyalist Kamarov and his men are seen trying to rescue you and the team, which includes Captain Price. So how did Price end up in the Gulag? Let me know in the comments section if you know the answer, or if I'm just missing something, because COD 4 doesn't explain this, nor does this game, even with the 5 year time skip from COD 4 to this game. Anyways, you get a little reunion between Soap and Price, and Soap is the main character you play as throughout COD 4 while being alongside Price. The Gulag looks like it's about to self-destruct, but luckily you're all able to make an escape. In an attempt to stop the war going on between the Russians and Americans, Price comes up with a plan to infiltrate a submarine docked at the Rybaki naval base near Petropavlovsk, Russia. Shepard warns Price to not go through with it, but Price didn't comply. At the start of the mission, you're found by Price, where the mission starts with some stealth as you go through the snowy forest after evading a BTR gunning at you two. Eventually, you and your team are found out and you have to fight your way to the base with the help of a Predator missile given to you. You meet up with Ghost and the others at the naval base and you use the same Predator missile to take out some enemies getting their attention and leading to you being given two minutes to reach the submarine before it submerges. When you make it to the location of the submarine, you, Ghost, and others provide cover for Price while he enters the submarine. Unaware of Price's plan, Ghost keeps warning Price that the silo doors in the submarine are about to open, meaning a missile might launch. Price says this and then this happens. Good. Yup, Price sends a missile to the upper atmosphere to cause a detonation to act as an EMP to cut all electronic devices throughout the east coast of the United States. This ends up saving the lives of the army rangers as well, but I will get into that later. This leads to Shepard getting a blank check by the secretary of defense to use it for whatever it takes to take down Makarov. He gives intel to the task force 141 about the last safe havens for Makarov, his safe house located in the Georgian-Russian border, or a US vehicle disposal yard called the Boneyard located in Afghanistan. You and Ghost go to the safe house while Soap and Price go to the boneyard. When you fight your way into the estate, you can only find enemies in there with no sight of Makarov. What you were able to find though was a crap ton of intel including Makarov's playbook with names, contacts, locations, etc. You connect the DSM to Makarov's computer to get the intel while protecting it from enemies. When the transfer is complete, you and Ghost have to rush over to the extraction point where Shepard meets with you and this is by far one of the saddest and most unexpected plot twists I've ever seen in the first person shooter. While Ghost carries you to the extraction point after being overwhelmed, you both meet with Shepard where he asks if you have the intel. Ghost says they do and then Shepard says this. Good. That's one less loose end. Yup, dude officially betrayed the good guys, which makes this even crazier because at the beginning, I thought Makarov was the main antagonist you gotta go take down, but I didn't think one of the assumed allies was gonna be the one to betray you. Caught me off guard completely when I first played through the campaign many, many years ago. But yeah, he unalives both you and Ghost, then Shepard's men, the Shadow Company, throws your lifeless bodies to the ground, and then they dump gasoline on you and set you on fire. What makes this even more sad is when your lifeless bodies are being thrown and gasoline being poured on you, you hear a price warning you guys to not trust Shepard and they're also being attacked by Shadow Company at the Boneyard as this is happening. Shepard. 
Shepard did this because he wanted to be seen as a war hero and take all of the glory for himself to take down Makarov. So since Roach isn't alive anymore, you play as Soap for the final levels of the campaign, for the main story. So you have to fight through the boneyard while Makarov's and Shepard's men are tearing each other apart. While you must fight to the extraction point so Nikolai can save you and Price, you hear Price communicating with Makarov himself. After telling Makarov about what's going down with Shepard, he asks Makarov to give him some intel on Shepard. Makarov is reluctant at first, but after Price asks him if he heard of the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Makarov spills the beans and tells Price Shepard's hideout location which is inside Hotel Bravo. After fighting through the armies, you make it to Captain Price who picks you up and they drive into the back of Nikolai's plane where they head to side Hotel Bravo. You and Price infiltrate the spot so you can track down Shepard. At first, you use stealth to get through, but once you make it into the cave and the shadow company catch on, you have to fight like normal. When you breach Shepard's command room, you don't find Shepard there, so you and Price hack into the door controls and push forward more until you reach a river to hop into a boat to pursue Shepard, while dodging choppers firing at you and going through caves. Shepard boards a pave low waiting for him by the river, but Price is able to shoot it down as you're instructed to hold the boat steady. With the strong currents, you and Price go down the waterfall. You wake up to the crash side of the pave low, dazed and hurt with your knife while seeing the remaining pilots on the brink of being unalive. You end up finding Shepard, but when you try to slice him, he blocks and rams your head on the roof of the car, which knocks you down and puts a knife through your gut. Shepard vents his frustrations of losing 30,000 men in the blink of an eye, referencing the nuke scene from COD 4 while the world just watched. He loads his revolver and is about to shoot you, but Price comes in for the save by fighting Shepard, kicking the gun out of his hand. You try to crawl to the gun, but Shepard kicks the gun out of your way and kicks you directly in the face. At this point, you're fading in and out of consciousness, seeing Price and Shepard still fighting. One minute Price has the upper hand, the next minute Price gets overwhelmed and Shepard gets the upper hand, getting on top of Price and relentlessly punching him in the face non-stop. This is where you look at the knife that's inside of you and make the desperate effort to remove the knife to use as a weapon to save Price. This is one of the most intense endings to a Call of Duty ever in my opinion, because it's a do or die situation. Either get the knife out of you to save Price or let him get beat to death by Shepard. The intensity of mashing the button the game tells you to while pulling out the knife, while the crazy visuals on the screen showing how much excruciating pain Soap is in is nuts. But you finally get the knife out, aim it to Shepard, and throw it at his eye, unaliving him instantly and saving Price. The story ends with Captain Price waking up and checking on Soap. Seeing that he's badly injured, he carries him up on his shoulders where Nikolai meets up with them. Price tells Nikolai they gotta get Soap out of there, and Nikolai says he knows a place, and boom, ending credits roll. Wow, wow, and wow. This campaign was phenomenal. This was like COD 4 if it was cranked up to 11. With the crazy ass airport massacre that sparks a world war, plus the amazing action packed missions, plus a plot twist that most people didn't see coming, it makes for an epic playthrough, or even a few playthroughs every now and then. I know I do. It makes me think one guy was the main antagonist to be defeated at the end of the game, only for someone who I assume was an ally to be this antagonist because he was a traitor. I recommend people give this a try if they haven't already. For the secondary story, you also get a prologue mission. You first play as Private Allen, where you and the team of US Army Rangers go to the Red Zone located in Afghanistan, where you take down opposing enemy forces while rescuing a stranded unit that's taking heavy fire by a school. At the end of the level, when you rendezvous with General Shepard and the others, he tells you that you'll be taking orders from him moving forward. This leads to Allen being transferred to Task Force 141 and partaking in the undercover mission, as mentioned earlier, where he unfortunately meets his demise at the hands of Makarov, sparking a declaration of war from Russia to the United States. From this point forward for the rest of the subplot, you play as Private James Ramirez. Even though the ACS module was presumed to be recovered by Task Force 141, the Russians were still able to get a hold of the information on it, leading to a surprise attack being launched towards the east coast of the United States thanks to their diversion by creating false readings for NORAD towards the west coast of the United States. This leads to your squadron, which includes your superior Sergeant Foley and Corporal Dunn, to head to northeastern Virginia to secure a VIP with the code name Raptor, no Ford, while dodging BTRs along the way. While passing through the houses, the BTR coming after you guys reaches a barricade where you guys have to throw smoke in order to be able to pass through without being destroyed. They push forward to Nate's restaurant where they find Raptor unconscious, so he gets moved to the meat locker where it's practically bulletproof. You guys get a supply drop on the roof of Nate's, which includes a sentry gun. You guys defend the roof for a little bit from enemy soldiers, but they start coming on top of the roof 
roof anyways. You get word on two BTRs plus an enemy soldier operating a Predator missile across from the restaurant. After sneaking past the BTRs and securing the Predator missile, you use it to take down the BTRs and enemy fast movers. But unfortunately, some enemy jets end up bombing nades, leading the team to relocating Raptor and where you guys have to secure the Burger Town. After you clear out the soldiers, you have two helicopters coming after you. The first one you take down at the same place where you first got the Predator missile, and the second one is where you have to go to the roof of Nace to take them down using stingers. Then you guys reach the convoy to get out of there where you're en route to Arcadia to save civilians. Still in northeastern Virginia, you and your team pass through the suburbs along with an ally tank named Striker while clearing out any enemy soldiers that are in the area, including houses. Before crossing the first bridge, you're informed by Overlord to head to 4677 Brookmere Road after you send the signal to destroy some aircraft vehicles. After that, you're ordered by General Shepard to go to the second floor of the house at a panic room to extract an HVI, highly valuable individual. Unfortunately though, when you guys make it, you find the HVI is not alive anymore. Here's where it gets crazier. Before the start of the mission, the screen shows an emergency broadcast where it warns about an emergency evacuation in progress and to tell everyone to go to the nearest emergency service shelter where the troops will meet you and to be aware of your surroundings. You're gonna find out in just a second why you see this. You load into an evacuation site your team is recuperating in located under the Washington Monument and it looks crazy. It also looks like it's about to fall apart. You have soldiers that are either hard at work on some electronical device, soldiers who look worn out and exhausted, or soldiers who are just straight up injured. After Russian forces target the area and head towards Washington DC, your team makes the move to fight them off. They've taken over most of the buildings located in the capital. You fight through enemy forces to secure the enemy crow's nest in the southwest corner. After that, you gotta provide cover fire with a sniper plus take down some helicopters. This buys some time for a friendly helicopter to make it to the roof to get you guys out of there, but despite you providing cover fire from the minigun on the chopper, it gets hit and y'all come crashing down. When you wake up, you see an amount of ally soldiers that you can count with one hand, along with an entire army of Russian soldiers after you. An ally gives you a weapon, but is then unalived instantly. You're given two mags to use the weapon before you run out of ammo. When all hope seems lost, a miracle happens. Remember when I mentioned during the main story about Price's plan to launch the missile to cause an EMP blast? Well, his plan ended up working, despite satellites and astronauts outside of the International Space Station also being unalived as a result, thanks to the shockwave created from said missile. But thanks to the EMP, it provided a distraction which made the Russian soldiers flee the scene temporarily after a helicopter crashed to the ground while other helicopters kept falling from the sky and vehicles exploding while you and your team try getting out of the street. You guys temporarily seek shelter inside of a building until the chaos is over. When you go outside, it looks like a dark ghost town. Even Dunn and Foley are commenting on how weird things are. They end up encountering another soldier which Dunn demands use a star or they'll shoot since it's an unidentifiable soldier. It's revealed to be an ally soldier. He tells us about Colonel Marshall leading a task force to Whiskey Hotel and that they should go there now. The soldier goes off to find other allies. When you guys enter a building and go to the second floor, a soldier slowly opens the door saying star to see if there's any allies but it's instead unalived by a room full of Russian soldiers that you need to waste. Afterwards, you guys are across from the Eisenhower building which is across from Whiskey Hotel. When you take out remaining opposition, you enter the Eisenhower building where you go downstairs and enter the president's bunker. From the bunker, you guys head to the west lawn of the White House where you meet up with Colonel Marshall. Foley asked Marshall about the situation and Marshall informs him that if they can take back control of the White House, there'll be a chance to get in contact with Central Command since the White House still has power. When you guys fight your way to the west wing of the White House, a hammered down protocol is heard from a radio where the city is deemed to be fallen. After fighting your way to the rooftop, you all use your flares to signal that the city has been retaken again by the US Army Rangers. With the sight of multiple flares in the area as well, a ranger and Dunn talk about invading Russia, but Foley says when the time is right. Overall, this is a really good subplot to the second installment of Modern Warfare. It gives an interesting insight on the result of Russia declaring war on the United States thanks to Makarov. They got overwhelmed pretty bad and nearly extinguished. Made me think all hope was lost and that it would end in the demise of the Rangers, just like how the Marines met their demise in COD 4. This also had the great plot twist with the EMP saving the lives of the Rangers thanks to Captain Price, plus the Armageddon-esque vibe with the Russians against the United States with the fall of Washington DC at the beginning. Very epic addition to the campaign. 
A really cool bonus feature the game gives you is the museum, but you have to beat the entire campaign on veteran difficulty. As the name implies, you pretty much get to look around three different rooms, two of them including characters and backgrounds from very memorable missions with very brief motions of the characters and enemies for the specific sections. It can range from soldiers coming down from a rope ready for battle to a juggernaut beating the shit out of a Russian soldier. I'll get into the juggernauts later on. In the third room, it's a showcase of the different aircraft like choppers and jets or tanks. The fun thing about this is the chance to actually eliminate the enemies from the two different rooms, but you have to do it one by one. And for both rooms, you have a variety of different weapons to choose from that ranges from pistols to shotguns to snipers and LMGs. Pretty much everything the game itself has to offer. If you don't want to eliminate them while they're showcasing the museum, you could press a red button in both rooms that says do not press. When you press, the characters in the museum come to life and they all start coming after you. So you gotta fight an entire army on your own. Good thing there's plenty of cover in the three rooms. Rooms, and it's satisfying to hear this sound effect go off once you clear out one of the rooms. One of the rooms has that juggernaut I told you about. Overall, very fun to revisit every now and then if I want to explore different weapons to use while taking down the characters. This is one of my favorite game modes to play through in this game. Spec Ops is pretty much where you're given specific objectives to complete that are based on the missions you play through in the campaign. They're split into five different sections, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. At first they're not too bad with one of them being the course that you ran through in the very first level of the campaign, then taking out enemies through some of the easiest waves ever, especially if you stay camped at the spot you spawn in as soon as the level starts, called Sniper Fi. Depending on the difficulty you choose, it can range from three waves to five waves. 3 being the easiest difficulty, and 5 being the hardest difficulty. Then you have the mission to take down a set number of enemies through the favela while avoiding civilians, which again depends on the difficulty you play the level on. This is called O Cristor Redentor, so on and so forth. Then you got your stealth missions where you gotta make sure you go undetected while taking down the enemies with silent weapons and getting from the starting point to the ending point, like you had to do in that one mission with Price. There's even some missions where you have to get a certain number of kills to reach a certain number of points to beat the level. It doesn't even have to just all be kills but if you have balls of steel you can try to get points through semtexing the tanks going around or using like an rpg or bazooka to take them down but good luck finding one the most interesting missions though are the spec ops missions that are based off campaign missions from cod 4 like suspension and wreckage it's like going through the bridge towards the end of the level but if it had much better design suspension was a good level with a nice challenge of enemies to go through plus a helicopter to deal with and you gotta get from point a to point b wreckage is pretty much the exact same level with the exact same map but it has but it has this very eccentric twist to it and wreckage instead of focusing on going from point a to point b you have to focus on blowing up all of the cars in the bridge you're given guns with grenade launchers or explosive weapons along with two sentry guns it was kind of weird because it's just the same shit different spin but it was kind of satisfying which is ironic because i love cars and the game wants me to commit car murder the next one was based on one of my favorite missions from cod 4 you know the one where you wear the ghillie suits and go sniping people with silenced weapons while being stealthy of course. There's one more iconic level which leads me to two player only spec ops missions in the game. The final COD 4 based spec ops level I'm gonna cover here is the mission with the AC-130. As epic as it sounds, one of you gets to ride in the AC-130 and blow up helicopters and send people flying while protecting your friend down below to get from point A to point B before time runs out. I like how unlike the COD 4 level you get to see what it's like at the bottom if you're lucky enough to be the one on foot. And the final two player only mission is called Big Brother where one of you gets to use a minigun from the chopper while the other one is on foot with one point of view two separating for a split second the guy on foot has to fight his way to the rooftop of a restaurant with your help taking down enemies and he catches a ride in the chopper at the end of the level when he reaches the rooftop speaking of this level you have a few spec ops missions that are based off this location alone like the one i mentioned earlier with the points after a kill called body count there's another one called homeland security where you have to face a wave of multiple enemies coming for you at whatever location you decide to camp at. As you go on, the waves include tanks and helicopters. What's hilarious about this mission is that when you step outside for too long, a predator drone notices you and sometimes they can take out their own soldiers, tanks, or helicopters. I'm sure if you're lucky enough to witness that, you'll get a good laugh. And if you're a racing game fanatic like me, they got some spec ops missions where you get to hot lap with the snowmobile from point A to point B and you gotta hit a set time to get those three stars. They also have a version where you must catch all of the flags for time to be added to the clock. If you don't catch enough of those 
flags in time and the clock runs out, you lose. Another odd mission because it's just the same mission as the original just with a twist of its own, but I personally don't see it as a big deal. Lastly, you got some missions that involve juggernauts which are these heavily armored behemoths with LMGs that when they pop up act as a jump scare, especially when you hear that gong. Unfortunately, these characters were Spec Ops exclusive and were never usable in online multiplayer until Modern Warfare 3. But yeah, in the mission snatch and grab after grabbing the first intel and getting off that plane, you'll hear this scary ass gong that sounds like a bootleg version of the Undertaker's gong. It's still scary though. Then suddenly you'll see a juggernaut coming out of nowhere just spraying you with the LMG if you're not careful. Easiest way to take out a juggernaut is flashbangs along with a few headshots with the sniper. But that's only one behemoth out of the way. I've had the case where the second one would just pop up out of nowhere as I'm heading towards the end of the mission so you just gotta do the same thing. Then it's done. The last mission that showcases juggernauts as a side attraction is in the mission estate takedown where you gotta take out 40 enemies which include soldiers, ghillie suit snipers, and you guessed it, juggernauts. A few of them show up randomly throughout the mission but with the downstairs room being a weapons gold mine a sniper should do the trick to beat the mission. On top of that they have two spec ops missions dedicated to just taking down juggernauts. The first one is at the oil rig mission from the campaign where you gotta take down 15 total juggernauts to win and get your three stars. This one isn't too hard for me because you can choose a sniper in a good camping spot to just allow the juggernauts to come to you while you snipe the crap out of them or let those claymores you place go off for the extra assistance or have a friend join you to make it even easier. Because the scary part is that as the level goes on it'll go from one popping up to two and then even three towards the end of the level. But not that tough because the final mission I'm about to show you is insanely difficult even with a friend. So you're back to the favela where you have to take out 10 juggernauts but here's the twist. You can only use explosives and a knife. So your only weapons are claymores, C4s, a grenade launcher called the thumper, and an RPG. And it's the same shit mentioned before. They will go from one to two to three coming in all at once to rush you as the end of the level comes as you're blowing up these juggernauts. I love how the game technically cheats because if you play with a friend and go down you're still able to use a pistol so the game lied to us. But yeah definitely look up a strategy video because even with a friend you're gonna have a hard time. What me and mine did was stay at a little room from the beginning and towards the end we just ran and he blew up some red barrels to kill the final three juggernauts and it's the final level out of all of these spec ops but i do find it very satisfying to beat the levels and get all those awesome 69 stars giggity, 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 giggity. overall this is an epic set of bonus side missions to do that are based off the campaign it's intense action-packed and it gives a nice challenge for a solo playthrough or even playing through it with a friend my favorite part as well as the intensity of anticipating for your partner to revive you when you go down while he or she has to fight through enemies to get you up or else risk losing the mission completely it's a lot of fun And lastly, we have the multiplayer. Compared to COD 4, the multiplayer for this game added some new features, like the introduction of choosing your own killstreak rewards. Basically, you have to go ahead and get a set amount of kills without dying to use your reward that can give you an edge against the competition. This can range from stuff such as a UAV radar to find the enemy player locations, to care packages where you get a random reward to use, to attack helicopters where helicopters shoot down the enemies on your behalf, to even a nuke. And guess how many kills you need to get without dying to get the nuke? Let me hear it. 25. Yeah, 25 kills without dying. You gotta either be having the luckiest day of your life, taking some crazy ass drugs, or you're just an esports caliber player. And the nuke ends the game right there when someone triggers it, no matter what. I love this because in COD 4 you get killstreak rewards, but you never got to choose them specifically because it's already given to you there, with the highest being just an attack chopper. They also introduce a new feature for some nice customizations under call signs and killstreaks called titles and emblems. In titles, you can have some cool titles titles along with some interesting artwork based off challenges you complete in the multiplayer game, weapons, flags, or just the rank you get as you play through the multiplayer. Emblems are acquired by basically the same methods as the titles, but what's cool about the emblems is the fact that some of them are also based off the three perks you can use, especially when you get the pro versions of them. These emblems also include the death streaks you unlock, plus some really sick logos from leveling up to the max level. Speaking of death streaks, this is the first game to introduce that features a bit of a slide 
slight advantage to the player if they die too many times, like me. This can range from being able to copy an enemy's class while watching the kill cam, to having increased health for a temporary amount of time, to being able to drop a grenade on an enemy out of nowhere once you die. This is pretty funny but pretty epic at the same time because even if you suck that multiplayer like me, you can still have an edge to be able to finally get that kill you've been patiently or unpatiently waiting for. The perks are there too, like your sleight of hand and scavenger, but you can also unlock pro versions of them with additional benefits as long as you complete specific challenges for it. Like with the sleight of hand, the pro version allows you to reload while aiming down the sights, while for scavenger you get extra ammo when starting the game. This game also introduces one of the most annoying but fun primary weapons to use, which is the riot shield. This is a bulletproof shield you can use to either bash people with or to block against enemies shooting at you. And if you want to be even crazier, you can have a shotgun, which for some really odd reason is a secondary weapon type instead of a primary weapon type in this game like COD 4, or an akimbo set of pistols to go crazy with. Speaking of akimbo, if you want to know something even crazier, you can make a shotgun akimbo as well. Yeah, you heard that correctly. If you weren't more OP already with one shotgun, how about two? It's only for one shotgun though. Even crazier is every single submachine gun in the game can also be used as an akimbo. This is insane because these aren't meant to do that just like the shotgun, but yet you're out here with two submachine guns wrecking people. And of course you can get your grenade launcher attachment for your assault rifle so you can get your noob tube on and one shot people if you know what you're doing. I like how some of the multiplayer maps are based off real locations from the campaign. For example, Terminal is from the Airport Massacre mission, which is such a golden map that it was released as a free DLC map on Modern Warfare 3. Then you also have Rust. I don't know if you noticed the background during your final showdown with Shepard, but that's pretty much what it is. It is my favorite map in this game because it's so nostalgic for me. I remember doing local split screen with my cousins all the time on that map playing some free for all. You also got a state based off the infamous level where Shepard betrays Task Force 141, and then finally the favela, which looks like an opposite section of the favela you passed through in the campaign. I really enjoy Afgang, Wasteland, and High Rise, especially High Rise because of the office buildings across from each other and the elevated area with the helicopter on it, plus the little area you can go on that's sort of outside of the map if you want to go crazy. I also love Afgang because of the desert area, plus the high elevation cliffs and the little buildings for some solid sniping areas, plus the wrecked planes at the lower ground. They're pretty good maps overall with a nice variety of small, medium, and large maps for all the different type of game modes you want to play through. My favorite mode growing up was free for all where it's every player for themselves. I like team deathmatch as well especially when it's a close game between both teams. There's way more multiplayer modes the game has to offer but the video would be 30 minutes longer than it needs to be if I go through all of them one by one. Overall the multiplayer is a lot of fun with a variety of new things added like customization with your title and emblem, your killstreak rewards, additional weapons customizations, and even death streaks to help you out out when you really need it. Very fun. I wish I was old enough to know what Xbox Live was back then to join in on these lobbies. So this is definitely the greatest Call of Duty Modern Warfare ever made in my opinion. You have an epic campaign with an engaging story for the main and secondary story, which leads me on the edge of my seat wondering what's gonna happen next. Plus the insane plot twist which adverted the focus of taking down Makarov to now having to focus on taking down Shepard. Plus the action was incredible all the way through. The Spec Ops is also an amazing touch because of having the chance to relive part of the campaign levels with a twist because of the objectives you have to do, despite how weird some of them are. It makes it even more intense and epic with a friend, especially the two player missions. The online multiplayer is also a lot of fun with additional customization options and new killstreak rewards that you have to work for to give you the edge you need to destroy the competition, plus the death streaks for an additional edge, plus weapon customization to go ballistic against the competition. It definitely lives up to the hype and I'm not sure if there'd ever be another like it. If you've enjoyed this video be sure to no scope the like button and noob tube the subscribe button and leave a comment letting me know what you think of the game and this video.